Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We're about to start in a couple of minutes, just finishing off a cup of coffee, waiting for people to join us. In the meantime, could you give us, as usual, a shout out, please? Could you tell us who you are and where you are from in the question and answer box? The early birds from the Yemen are with us and active as always. Welcome. If you're just joining us, we'll be starting in a few minutes. So as always, if you could give us a shout out in the question and answer box, who you are and where you are from. Colleagues now joining our Yemeni friends from Egypt. Hello, Ahmed. And Libya too. Thank you very much, Libya. If you're just joining us, we'll be starting in a few minutes. In the meantime, could you give us a shout out if you tell us where you are and who you are in the question and answer box. So we'll be starting in just under a minute, according to my clock here. If you're just joining us, please give us a shout out. Tell us who you are and where you are from in the question and answer box. That would be great. Colleagues joining us from Egypt, from Libya, from the Yemen, Morocco, Lebanon, Tunisia, Saudi Arabia, and of course Bahrain. There's, uh, I think a relation of Mo Salah, who's joined us from Egypt. Hello, please say hello, <laughs> Mohammed for us. We're big fans here. Colleagues from Iraq as well, welcome. Okay, thank you very much indeed for joining us this afternoon. Very warm welcome. Good afternoon. My name's John, John Shackleton. I work for the British Council. I'm based in Cairo and I look after our teacher development work for the Middle East and North Africa. I'm joined as always by my colleagues, Nora, Nora Al Saba from the British Council in Bahrain, Amira Wahid who's from the British Council, also here in Egypt, in Cairo. Asil, who's recently re returned to the mother country, to her native Egypt. And of course, Hala Hala Ahmed, who leads on all of our teacher development work in Egypt, and who is the face, of course, of the Ask Hala webinar series. 
So, um, as always, please use the question and answer box to interact with today's presentation. We are extraordinarily impressed with the quality of the comments that you um, are providing for us. Um, it, it's uh, uh, really quite fantastic. So keep those coming in and we will do our best to respond to them uh, as we go along. Um, I always say this, well, I've been saying it recently anyway, that this is a key topic. It's something which is fundamental um, for us as teachers. And this afternoon's webinar is absolutely no exception to that um, observation. You know, really, it's um, um, we, we can't stress how important observation is so that we can better understand how we're doing as teachers. That's clear. Um, we would also strongly argue that um, too often teaching takes place behind closed doors. And we would say that the benefits of opening up your classroom, our classrooms, are in fact many indeed. And Halla and Asiel will be talking about the, the benefits. That's one element of today's webinar. We sent you some pre and post webinar questions in the joining instructions as always. So we would like you to please fish those out if you can and to reflect on them now during the, the webinar, but also importantly after the webinar. And if you have any particular comments around those questions in particular, as well as some of the content that Hala and Asiel will cover, please put them in the question and answer box. As always, we'll be recording this session. So if you've got friends who couldn't attend this afternoon, they'll be able to visit our website and we'll put the link in the, the chat box for you and um, review the recording and also the slides that Hala and Asil are using. So um, I think that's all from me. So I'd like to hand over to Hala and to Asil um, to make a start with this particular theme, watching other teachers teach and how to get the most out of it. Thanks, John. So let's crack on immediately. Uh, this is our uh, webinar today and these are our uh, learning outcomes that we're hoping to, to cover by the end of today's webinar. We're going to look at the benefits of reaching, watching peers in action. And by this, we mean the benefits of watching other teachers, other colleagues teach. And also, we're going to look at uh, what you should be looking for if you're an observer, if you're observing a teacher or if you're the teacher being observed. So we're going to, to look at some practical takeaways and some practical tips in today's webinar. And last but not least, we're going to look at different approaches and, and practical tips and key considerations while giving and receiving feedback. I hope you're, uh, you, you hear me OK and I hope you can see the slides OK as well. So uh, as a first uh, start, a first, first thing to do in the webinar, I'd like you to look at this picture and read these two quotes and tell us in the Q&A box what the picture and the quotes make you feel or think. And if you, if you can't see the slide yet, I can read out the quotes for you. What you do not know, indeed what you cannot know, is often more important that, than what you do know. That was cited by Macbeth in 1999. The other quote says, observation more than books and experience more than persons are the prime educators. And this is said by Amos Bronson Alcott. 
Uh, till till you're uh, putting your responses in the Q&A box, I'd like also to reflect on my own experience. I've always I've always believed that the two heads are better than one. So I always believe that when I share ideas with with a colleague or a friend, I usually come to a better conclusion. I usually come up with a better solution to a problem. So that's general in life. And uh, I also remember when I when I was teaching, whenever I share ideas and whenever I share lesson plans with with colleagues, it's either I'm helping a colleague or myself getting getting a better idea or you know a creative idea to my to my existing lesson plan. So it's it's always a win-win situation when I consult a colleague. And uh, in my in my experience, in my teaching experience, I think I learned a lot from observations than I than I did from uh, more than I did from books. That's that's very true. So I think I think I can re really relate to the quote by Amos Bronson Alcott. What about you, John? That will take you a little bit back in time. Do you, do you relate to the picture and the two quotes? Are you suggesting I'm too old to remember? Is it? <laughs> no. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with um, with your second point in particular. I think it's it is very true that um, of course we 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 learn from reading and we learn in all sorts of ways. But I think it's watching other people do things, you know, especially things as complex as teaching. That 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 as that quote suggests is um, is is the prime uh, way of of learning. Um, some of the comments coming in uh, echo what you were saying about two heads are better than one and sharing experiences, um, you know, are particularly important. Um, with Sal, for example, mentioned that. Um, there was another comment about you cannot know everything, which is so true, isn't it? And that, that we always have something to, to learn from our colleagues. I think that's a, a you know, really good comment to, to, to hang on to. We cannot know everything. The learning process has not finished and we're ready and open to see other people who are doing similar things, how they do it. That's an interesting point I'd like to dwell a little bit on. We cannot know anything. It's not because we're teachers it, that, that we, we own the ultimate knowledge of everything. That's not true. And I think this links nicely to the first quote. What you do not know is far more important than what you already know, because what you know anyways is going to be limited, even regardless of the number of years of experience you have, and regardless of the important role you're playing, what you know will remain limited compared to what you still do not know because because ultimately and back to the point mentioned by by our colleague we cannot know everything and and when i was preparing for today's webinar uh, i read something uh, about uh, uh, vygotsky work and there was that chart and vygotsky actually divided our knowledge into three layers a layer that knowledge I can I can do myself. So the first layer is the knowledge I can I can access myself, something I can help myself. And the second layer is the knowledge I can access with the help of others. And the third play, the third layer is knowledge that I cannot access. There are things that I cannot no things that beyond my control and I, and I quite like this idea right so i'll i'll hand over now to to my colleague asil who's going to tell us about what another group of teachers thought about the benefits of watching their peers teaching in watching action their peers teaching in action hi john hi hala can you hear me yeah yes Yes. Hi. So in today's Have Your Say, I've asked teachers about what do they think about the benefits of watching peers in action. And they have shared with me lots of uh, benefits and reasons from their perspective. So the first one was uh, engage in professional development. 
it's part of their professional journey to observe other teachers or their peers because they get to learn from them. Get expertise from others. Uh, enhance students' learning through reflective pra uh, practice. Uh, because, of course, our purpose is to serve our students and to serve the best for them. So by absorbing other teachers, we get to see from them, we get to learn from them uh, their techniques, their new ideas in order to serve our students or to enhance their learning. Celebrate excellence in teaching by observing others and emulating good practices. Encourages honest conversation. Uh, gives you an opportunity to apply what you have learned from others and provides a new way of approaching a problem. Also boosts confidence for teachers to, to bring out the best uh, out of them and to share their best practices, their best uh, techniques. Finally, demonstrates leadership by observing and supporting other teachers. And uh, actually, when I was working back in Oman, we used to have something between us as teachers, we call it show and tell, where we get to share some of our practices that we have done during our classes as well. So, so we get to share with all our colleagues and it's a very effective way to learn from each other and to see new ideas and techniques and on how we can apply them in our classrooms especially when we were teaching online because we've learned a lot. So it was more like uh, joining force together. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Asil. And I'm yeah, really I'm glad, glad that really what I'm looking at, what I'm looking at the screen now uh, as the outcome of your discussion with, with uh, your peers, with your, with the, your colleagues, really resonates with uh, what I'm going to discuss in the rest of the webinar today in terms of the benefits of watching other teachers in action. So let's let's expand a little bit on, on the points uh, Asil uh, collected from her discussion with, with her colleagues. And, uh, and let's look now at the definition of peer observation. So if you're new to the concept observation and the peer observation, or if you're new to the profession in general. So what peer observ observation actually means? I want you to look at the definition on the screen. I've, I've removed the three key words from the definition. Think about it and type in the Q&A uh, and try to guess the, the missing words. So peer observation is a mm, way process that can mm, both the observer and the teacher being observed with the goal of mm, learning and teaching. I can give you clues, but but let me see if you if you can do your best. Can you first, can you guess the first letter in the first word, John? Um, I can, but I'm going to leave it to um, <laughs> my good friend Shahar, who's come in with a very good suggestion, which mm -hmm. could be right. We don't know which is two. Two way process. That's correct, Shahar. Well done. It's a two way process. It's the word peer. Peer means somebody who's equal, somebody who's similar. So it's a two way process, it's not from up to down. It's not from down upward. It's two way process that can. OK, well. Um, the relative of Mo Salah. Has made some other suggestions, which I think it could fit in there for the, the, the two way process, which is uh, mutual. Mutual way process, OK, that gives the meaning as well. And. Um, still waiting. Perhaps help that's coming in. Help both the observer and the teacher being observed. That's correct. Any other word? Support. Benefit. Support that's benefit excellence. So yeah, 
So support benefit help both the observer and the teacher being observed, observed all is correct with the goal of. Uh, uh, I can give I can give the first letter of this word. My answer starts with I. OK, I think Gunnar from Bahrain maybe has the correct answer. Improving. Oh, yeah. Improving learning and teaching. And that's perhaps that's perhaps the key word here. So the primary oh, the suggestions, sorry, other suggestions are that are good. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, serving. Right, In serving. Enhancing, yes, absolutely right. So from from your responses, guys, we can see that the primary purpose of observation is improvement, development, enhancement. Sometimes we use observation to give uh, to assess the teacher's performance, to evaluate the teacher's status, then take decisions on recruiting teachers, promoting teachers, or even dismissing teachers. But this is actually a secondary goal of the, the observation, but observation originally seeks the improvement of learning and teaching. This is the primary purpose of the process. So let's expand on the on the points uh, Asil and her colleagues gave under the benefits of peer observation, but we're going to talk uh, about this in three directions. Really, first, the benefits for the teacher being observed. So, what are the benefits from your point of view of peer observation for the teacher being observed? We've touched uh, a little bit upon up, upon this at the beginning of the webinar, but it's your chance now to provide more insights in the Q&A box about the benefits for the teacher being observed before before I display the answers on the screen. One to keep you to to get you started. Peer observation works alongside other forms of professional development. Anything else? And I think that was also that was referenced in in Asil's part. There are there are several forms of professional development and peer observation is one of them. But where where does peer observation stand uh, in the professional development spectrum? Is it supplementary? Is it complementary? Is is it standalone? What's it exactly? Quite a few comments coming in, Hala, to um, answer your first question. Yeah, feedback, one mm -hmm. of the benefits. Um, help in preparation. Nice one. Um, engage, engage with others. Um, right. Yeah, feedback in particular on, on um, again, it's it's Mo Salah's uh, relative feedback on strength and weak points. Yeah, strength nice. and weaknesses. Nice. So this is a list of the benefits uh, of peer observation for the teacher being observed. Look at this list, have a think, and again, type in the Q&A your interpretation of each point. So. I gave you a clue on the first one and I asked you a question. Where does the peer observation stand on the professional development spectrum? So it's one form of it, but how it works alongside the other forms. Does it complement them? Does it supplement them? Does it stand alone? What, what are your thoughts exactly? And think about the list of the of the benefits. Encouraging honest conversation and what's the benefit of having honest, open, genuine conversation between between colleagues, providing ways, fresh ways, new ways to tackle a problem, boosting confidence. Asil 
also brought this uh, brought this idea from her uh, from her group from her uh, colleagues and of course it goes without saying that this process should encourage reflection and we cannot stress enough how ref how important reflection is in this in this particular profession the profession of teaching Guna makes a, from Bahrain makes a very good point and uses the word missing links. And I think that's important in, in, in this. I think that it, it does help you to realize, as your quote says, what you're not doing mm. and how can you know what you're not doing? And so that, that thing about missing is quite, quite a good word. That's a very interesting point, identifying the gaps you have in your teaching. By the way, whether you are the teacher being observed or the teacher observing because because you can still identify gaps in your teaching if you even if you're sitting in the observer seat so what's missing what we do not know what are the gaps in our teaching all of these are very good points to, to cover when it comes to the benefits of peer observation all right so let's let's have a look on on my notes now I see peer observation as as the space or the opportunity for the teacher to apply. So this is the time of application, applying what the teacher learned from the other CPD forms. So as as John said, we read books, we go to conferences, we attend online webinars, we attend the training. But when and how and what is the space really to apply all of that to try out the ideas we collected from all of all of those cpd forms it's the peer observation or the observation it's the classroom practice testing the ideas while somebody is watching while somebody is in the position of telling you how your teaching was going the point around the honest conversation, it's it's about also encouraging constructive feedback. Feedback that is not judgmental. We do not give judgments here, but we're being open, we're being constructive. And I think the word the evidence here is key. If you want your feedback to be constructive, if you for if you want to be open. To, to feedback, you must get evidence. I mean, if you, if I'm being observed as a teacher and my observer is telling me that my instructions were unclear, if the observer doesn't give me evidence to this, I, I might consider it as a judgmental comment, right? If I can't see, if I do not realize that my instructions were unclear, and with the absence of evidence, the observer didn't give me an example. I would I would consider this as a judgmental opinion, a judgmental comment. So I can't be open and I can't consider the feedback as constructive. The point around addressing your problems, it's actually your opportunity to test a solution in action and watch your solution working in action. I've got a problem that uh, my students talk in Arabic uh, too much in class, for example. I, I find it difficult to manage their behavior when they work in groups together, for example. Uh, right, so I had a chat with a colleague. I read a couple of, uh, uh, of articles and I, I could identify a couple of classroom ideas. Now I want to try this solution and see if it works in action. I go to the class, I ask one of my colleagues to come and watch. I wanted somebody with like a second eye to tell me what, what was going on. And it's my opportunity now to approach this problem with a fresh approach, with a fresh way uh, in action. Point around the confidence when you work with someone from the same field and this person understand the daily demand of your classroom life it's really it's it's really something 
it, it, it can be very reassuring to you as a teacher. And, at, and it also comes as a good reminder that all colleagues have gaps, have something missing in their teaching that can be developed, right? Because as we agreed earlier that there is a mutual benefit for both the teacher being observed and the observer, the teacher observing. So with this concept in mind, we were all reminded that everybody still has a gap or a part in their teaching that, that deserve a development. So this gives us a kind of confidence. It boosts our feeling of self-confidence. And also having this person, the person who's watching you, giving you feedback, having a discussion with you from the same, same field. So when you, when you express your concerns and worries, this person listens, this person understands. Again, this will help you relax in your classroom, even if you know that, that your teaching isn't perfect, but so, but so is the other person's teaching, right? And when you open your classroom doors to colleagues to come in and, and watch your watch your uh, your teaching, perhaps you feel apprehensive at the beginning, you feel nervous at the beginning, but by doing it, by, by practicing it, you start to build on your, your confidence. So today you're nervous, tomorrow you welcome other colleagues to your classroom. Next week you welcome the school principals Maybe next month you welcome some a leadership from the educational leadership people. So it, it boosts the teacher's confidence indeed. Reflection again, it's it's an opportunity to reflect where, where, when, uh, where and when you reflect. You reflect before the observation happens because you plan for it. You reflect after the observation happens because you analyze your teaching with the support of a colleague, the second eye. And actually observation gives you the space to stop and pause and think about what you're doing rather than just keep teaching, teaching and teaching every day, day in and day out without even stopping and thinking about what you're doing. Now the, the second direction, the other direction of the benefits of peer observation is for the observer, the teacher who is observing. As we did with the teacher being observed, I'd like you to, to send us through the Q&A box your thoughts about the benefits for the observer. So when I step in a class and watch another teacher teach what do i get what's in it for me I'll give you the first one to get you started it develops communication skills but how that's a question for you so think about the re the rest of the list of benefits and think about the interpretation of the first point, how the observation develops your communication skills as an observer. Are we getting some anything? Yes, some interesting comments coming in around, um, uh, essentially around newness, I think, uh, new strategies, um, new ideas, um, and also an interesting one, and, and we'll perhaps talk about this, about the, 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 the learn from other people's mistakes. Um, you know, maybe learn from um, different approaches that, that pe people use. It's difficult to come down, I suppose, definitively on what's a mistake and what's right, I suppose. But it's a good point, isn't it? That um, you can see when somebody does something and you, you think to yourself, hmm, yeah, I've got a different way of doing it that that might be more effective. Yeah. OK, um, an interesting point as well from uh, Shahir, who says who uses the word stealing, steal some ideas. Mm. And I think um, that's quite an interesting one, isn't it? I think for, for two two things, really, that, um, you know, who do ideas belong to in the first place? So can you can you steal something that's uh, already in the public domain, I suppose? 
And also, I think um, it's this other thing, which for me anyway is really, really important when we're talking about benefits. It's about getting used to the fact that you're that, that what 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 you are doing in in the classroom as a teacher is actually a public event already. You know, you're you're in class and you're with a group of of, of learners, obviously. So I think that's really important when you're looking at the the benefits that you get used to the idea that things are in the public domain, that this is a public event, and that enables you to step back a little bit and kind of give up ownership of it, not get too defensive, not to get too worried about it, and say, look, you know, this is the event, what do you think? Rather than say, this is what I did, yeah. what do you think? That's a very interesting point that we're going to recap later on in the webinar. But I'd like to go back to Shaher's point as well uh, about stealing ideas and uh, stepping into the classroom as an observer wearing the hat of a learner. So I'm going to watch Shaher in his lesson. Maybe I learn something rather than I'm going to watch Shaher in his lesson to evaluate his teaching or to tell him if he's a good teacher or not. That's that's quite important thing. And uh, stealing ideas from somebody who might have well stolen them from somebody else is quite is quite important for the for the growth mindset and for for being less competitive in this profession. So yeah, I, I come across colleagues here and there who are saying that was my idea. That was my idea. How do you how 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 dare you? How would you how would you use it in, in your class without my permission? Well, it, it is your idea, but perhaps you took it from somebody else and somebody else claiming it's their idea and so on. That's that's human knowledge. Human knowledge is constructive. That's why we still have inventions. That's why we still have scientists every day because people people build on each other knowledge. It, it renews itself. It builds on itself. Right. So. You wanted to say something, John? Yeah, I was just going to say Wafa makes a really, really interesting point about um, feeling important. Mm. And that your opinion matters. You know, I mean, it's so true that, isn't it? That that it, it is an opportunity. You know, you're an expert in in teaching, aren't you? You know what's going on in in classrooms, and you you go in and observe one of your colleagues. It's a context you're very familiar with, so it is the opportunity. I think it's an important point that perhaps I haven't thought so much about. That um, you know, it's an opportunity for you to to demonstrate your expertise. And I think perhaps perhaps this comes comes in line in line in, in line uh, with the other point in the previous slide about boosting confidence. So when I when I entered the class as an observer because my colleague approached me because my my colleague believes in my teaching skills and knowledge. I think that boosts boosts my confidence as an observer as well, right? Uh, because because I feel I feel trusted. I feel appreciated. I feel my knowledge is being valued by, by peers. So these are the two points we have in, in this list. Developing communication skills, and I'd like to know your thoughts on this, and helping you to reflect on your teaching. Of course, I've covered this in so many ways so far. Uh, as John and other colleagues said, when you watch uh, another person, uh, another teacher teach, you start thinking, oh, I might steal this idea. I think that works very well in my in my Saturday class or oh, I think I teach this more effectively using a different method. So it's it 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 keeps you thinking and reflecting about your own teaching. Uh, any thoughts about the communication skills? So when you observe a teacher, you prepare, of course, to discuss the teaching and learning that you sow. And at this point, you start thinking about how you would communicate your feedback 
to the teacher, to a colleague, to somebody who trusted you, to somebody who trusted your skills and knowledge, and above all, your honesty. And there is also a point ab about um, confidentiality here. When I allow you, we, well, the class is in the in the public domain in a sense, but also there is some something around uh, confidentiality here. If if I messed up the class, it's not nice if you go if you go out and started sharing this with other colleagues or with the school leadership, right? So now you're you're a person who is trusted. And you'd like to communicate your feedback to a colleague. How would you do this? You start thinking about your communication skills and start thinking about the best way of approaching this. You start thinking about giving positive and constructive feedback rather than judgments. And you start thinking about supporting your feedback with evidence from the observation. Again, all in this in a way that doesn't sound or feel intimidating to your colleague. So I think, Mona, your instructions or the way you uh, you set the, the students in groups wasn't really clear because I, I could see that the students were lost a little bit and they didn't know what to do. And uh, I've noticed that the student X was asking their colleagues about where they should sit and what their group's names are and, and stuff like that. So I, I judge the action or I focus on the action rather than the person. I focus on what the students do rather than the, what the teacher does. And I support my opinion with evidence, with examples. It's not like I think your instructions were unclear and I don't think the way you put the students in groups really worked. So when I get a question uh, I, like why, why do you think so? Or I can't remember this happened. And I respond just like that. This is my opinion. That's that's what I feel. This is this is what I think that that's not that's not good communication skill, I think. Reflection. Again, you can pick up, you can steal, as Sheher said, useful strategies, useful ideas that can solve issues in your own teaching. Again, both ways. You can reflect and think about yourself as a better teacher, or you can reflect and think about yourself as a teacher that can be better. Works, works both ways. Another interesting quote from Tenenberg in, 19, in, in 2016, in observing another teacher, the teacher engages in a double seeing of her own classroom in comparison to the classroom that she observes. Remember when I said it works both ways? It's the double seeing. You see somebody else teaching, and you compare this to your own teaching. You're seeing the two, the same class from two different angles. The third direction, the third layer of benefits is the benefits for the school and the institution. It's quite essential because, because if you want to rock the boat at your school and and tell them something like, hey guys, I want, I have a brilliant idea for everybody. How about if if we go and visit each other in, 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 in classes and, and observe each other and give each other feedback? The school principal might think that this is not a good idea, really, because you're going to cause a mess between classes because you're going to embarrass your, yourself and your colleagues because you're going to cause disputes and personal problems. They can, they can have all sorts of concerns, but if they're really aware of the benefits of peer observation, they might be a source of support to your brilliant idea. So what do you think of the benefits for the school or institution? Can you respond uh, to this question in the Q&A box, please? Here's the first one for you to, to get you start thinking.
So it creates a kind of school commitment to professional development. How and what does that mean? Some interesting comments coming in from uh, Nancy and uh, also from Saha. Nancy talks about um, <clears throat> it's about celebrating strengths, um, mm -hmm. which institutions like to do. So collectively, collaboratively, we are, I suppose, more than the sum of our parts. I think that's uh, that's an interesting one. Um, and I think the other the other point um, about uh, cooperation and team cohesion. You know, these are all benefits for the institution. Interesting comments from Sahar and Nancy. I, I really appreciate this. Uh, yeah, it's the the wholesome culture rather than individuals. So if if everybody's doing peer observation, if everybody started to develop the sense of trust and faith, this is this is going to become the school culture, the school general atmosphere, everybody is committed to their own professional development. Uh, everybody is approaching everybody else, asking them to come and observe uh, because I because they are keen on their improvement. They're keen on their professional development. And it goes without saying, of course, and this this links back to Sahar and Nancy's point about celebrating success. It's something that schools take pride in. When we when we all talk about each other's brilliant teaching, good techniques, and we celebrate this, for example, in the school's magazine, for example, or in the school's assembly, that that's that's something the school would would definitely appreciate. And again, the the school's culture of commitment to professional development leads to another school's culture around open and sharing. Uh, uh, good practices. So again, the class is open. The class has no walls now. There is nothing to hide. We share the good practices, but we also share we, we also share the weaknesses so that we can improve them. We also share our vulnerabilities so that we can be strong together. So again, the culture of commitment leads to the culture of openness and sharing, and that's very important for for the school's uh, strength holistically or generally. And uh, another comment, I think, that kind of sums up where all of that is leading. I think that you've said, which is the word trust. You know, such mm. a good word. Absolutely, and when when this becomes the general atmosphere or a kind of agreed culture within within uh, the school, the school uh, member members or staff, teachers start to feel they have the power to make changes and and influence the the policies set by the school. This goes back to the point I made earlier. If if the school principal or the school administration resists the idea of peer observation first or at the beginning, but perhaps when they start to see the benefits of it, you can let the teachers cause changes in the policy. So moving from peer observation as a no, no, as a very bad idea, as a bad idea that can cause chaos in the class to a good idea that everybody can adopt to improve their teaching and learning. So yes, this goes back to the to the uh, creating the atmosphere of learning. So everybody is keen on their learning and their own development and and the creating PLC or professional learning community. That's another word for communities of practice, the CLP, uh, where everybody is dedicated to improvement and everybody opens up uh, and share strength as well as uh, weaknesses. And this goes back to, to Nancy's Sahar point around celebrating good practice and celebrating success. Also, uh, the research done by Hattie 
Masters and Birch in 2015 notes that a shared approach to the professional development has proven to be effective and improve the teacher effectiveness rather than working on isolated islands and hiding hiding techniques and hiding, hiding teaching practices from each other. Shared approach has proven by research to improve and enhance teacher effectiveness. Again, opening up, cultivating an atmosphere of openness and sharing would, would break the feeling, the nasty feeling of isolation. Teaching is a profession of isolation. You stand alone in the class and you move from a class to the other all alone. You think about your classes, lesson plans, students with problems all alone. It's a horrible feeling of isolation and, and it, it, it does lead to teachers burn out uh, and losing appetite and passion to teaching. But again, this culture of openness, sharing, standing to get together prevents teachers from just passively uh, accepting a new knowledge coming top down from leaders or just implementing changes imposed top down from leaders because they support each other and they, they work uh, peer to peer. Again, this is my point around causing changes to the policy set by the school, because because if if you want to have an effective school system, listen to the teachers' voices and encourage them to develop their own teaching, and this might give you some insights, some some ideas towards improving your own policies set by the school. Anything you'd like to, to say, John, before before I move on to my next part? No, I mean, there's, um, you're probably going to come on to talk about this. Um, there was a point about, um, you know, from Libya about the difference between um, peer observation in order to learn and being observed by a head teacher or a, a supervisor um, in order to evaluate. Um, so that, that's a, you know, that's an important thing. And just to stress that we're talking today anyway, about um, you know observation for learning purposes rather than uh, formal evaluation. Right, but I would I would say principles are the same, tools are the same, the observation protocol and cycle are the same. The only thing is that the first type of observation, the peer observation, has got this ultimate goal of improvement and learning. No judgments made, no decisions taken. But in the other type of formal observations, we we use the outcome of the observation to give an evaluation of the teacher's performance. We say this this teacher is an effective teacher and he comes in the top five at the school, for example, and hence they deserve this promotion or this teacher is rubbish. Their teaching is very poor and we don't think we can continue having them on board. We think of like finishing or ending their contract. It's it. You take decisions here, but you don't take decisions here. You just help the process of learning and improvement. Um, I'm moving now to to uh, what the research says uh, about peer observation. Why why research believes that peer observation is a useful thing. If you remember Vygotsky's social learning theory, this guy back in, in the 60s claimed that people in general learn better when they interact so socially with each other. Yeah, and again, this, this uh, uh, stresses the point of uh, breaking the walls and breaking the feeling of isolation. Step out, leave your deserted island and join the party. This is how human beings uh, learn better and more effectively. So peer observation fits into an area of psychology called the, the social cognitive theory. Social means people, 
cognitive means thinking and how the brain works. So it's like a combination of how your brain works in relation to how you socialize as a human being with your surroundings. And the theory claims that people can learn from taking part in social interactions and observing others. I don't want you to think that observing other teachers and being observed is 100% a, uh, a business transaction or something. It does involve social interactions. We talked now about communication and communication skills and how to give honest feedback, how to give constructive and supportive feedback, how not to be uh, judgmental and so on. These are these are social interactions. The, the language you use to give feedback and the language you use to respond to feedback. This is social interaction. Being on the same page and understanding the profession demands and showing sympathy and the empathy. This is social interaction. So Vygotsky, who, who, who was a Russian teacher and a psychologist, of course, stated that we learn as human beings through our interactions and communications with others. And he actually examined how our social environments. That's in the school. This means colleagues, school principals, parents, students. Chatting over a cup of tea. Discussing weekend plans. Venting about workload and all of that he suggested that this social environment influence our learning process and he suggested that learning takes place through the interactions we have with our peers are you familiar with the social learning theory have you applied the theory in 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 uh, on your teaching with uh, in designing your activities and in your classroom practices and in your interactions with the students in designing your assignments now i'm moving to the next part which is about six common misconceptions about peer observation i'll show you a list of the most common misconceptions and I'd like you to look at them and type in the Q&A box which one you're most familiar with or which misconception is the most common to you. Yeah, so you have you have a list of six misconceptions about peer observation. Peer-to-peer -peer is the only way to carry out an observation. You should only give positive feedback. It takes too long to carry out a peer observation cycle. Colleagues should be from the same department. The colleagues observing each other. Peers who observe each other must want to develop the same part of their teaching practice. I have to agree with the feedback from my peers. So you've got a list of six misconceptions. Which misconception is the most common in your teaching experience? Can you respond to that in the Q&A, please? While um, colleagues are thinking about that, I just wanted to um, just um, mention a comment that came came in about um, <clears throat> what happens next. And uh, I believe you're going to be talking a little bit about that. About so, okay, so you you've been observed, or you've observed somebody else. So what's next? You know. Yeah, we're coming to this part, right? So which which of these misconceptions is the most common in your in your experience, John? Which one you you can relate to most? Um, yeah, I think number two is a very interesting one, um, and I think it's the uh, we run the risk, don't we, of being kind of um, broadly and unspecifically 
very happy with what we have just seen and we shy away from um, you know looking at what happened in the lesson that could be improved on and I think um, it's uh, it is a popular misconception I think that um, peer-to-peer -peer observ observation as opposed to um, kind of formal eval uh, evaluation type feedback that the purpose of, of peer observation is basically just to say yeah no that was that was fine good well done thank you very much for letting me watch you you know that's not what we're talking about so i think that's a really important misconception and possibly the most common right did we get any responses in the q a box So one one misconception. Feel free to stop me if you if you get any interesting points from the Q and A box, John. So one misconception is uh, is about the peer to peer. It's done only with two people, which is not true. You can involve more than two people in the observation. Three colleagues can be working together. One is teaching, two colleagues observing. It happened to me personally, and. We should always we should only give positive feedback. No, observation must be non judgmental and we agreed on that. But but giving only positive feedback entails really a risk that there could be no change in teaching. So if I always compliment you with nice words and I say only nice things like your teaching is fine, your teaching is good. Da, 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 how would you change your teaching? How would you develop? How would you grow? And I think to overcome this, we need to think carefully about pairing up colleagues. So we need to pair up colleagues who are willing to give each other honest feedback rather than either complimenting and saying only nice things to each other or disputing and fighting with each other. So thinking about pairing up colleagues carefully might be uh, useful here. Oh, I don't have time to carry out any peer observation. The cycle is too long. That's not true. You don't have to observe the whole lesson. You don't have to stay in the class for the entire lesson. It could be one segment of the lesson if you agree on a focus for the observation. So beforehand, if you both meet and agree to look specifically about one teaching aspect, one teaching skill, let's say managing behavior or giving instructions or explaining new language. It's just pick one point, focus on it and go to the observation or to the class and observe this and this only. So when you when you when it's time to to give feedback, your feedback is targeted and focused and you're using your time efficiently. We must be from the same department. We must be both English teachers. Well, that's not necessarily and it really depends on the purpose of the observation. If you want to observe for content for the subject matter, of course you need to observe an English teacher. But if you want to observe for teaching skills, something like time management or something like managing large groups in classroom, it, it doesn't have to be an English teacher. You can observe a math teacher, a science teacher. So we both must want to develop the same part of, the, the, uh, of our teaching practice. So if we both have poor time management, it's we must observe each other. No, that's not true. It's actually better and could be useful if we have different strengths and different areas of weaknesses so we can observe and, and exchange ideas. I need to nod and agree on all the feedback from my peer. No, you don't have to. But you need to be open to receiving feedback 
and it's it's not essential for you both to have the, exactly the same understanding and the same interpretation of the events and the steps and the procedures in the observed lesson. That's that that's not essential really. But it's the open discussion and the honest conversation that is really important and crucial for both of you. Now back to the point uh, or the question asked earlier, what's next to how now we're talking about the practical part of it. How do we do the peer observation? All right, so I want to improve now. I want to try out uh, uh, a few ideas that I saw in a webinar or I've heard of in a conference and I want to invite a colleague or two to observe me. How do we do it? There is a cycle for the for the observation. Pre observation during the observation and the post observation or before the observation during and after. So what do we do before the observation? The observer and the teacher should agree on a focus for the observation from the previous slide. You need to focus on one specific teaching aspect to observe, to analyze and to give feedback on. It's not advised really to go and observe everything in the lesson from the beginning to the end. It's not really manageable to uh, or realistic to give feedback and analyze everything that happened in the lesson. So focus on one single teaching aspect. But while focusing on this aspect, think carefully about the needs of your students. So you want your observer to focus on the way you introduce new language, for example your way of your your teaching approaches in in explaining grammar points for example right you want this because you think this is an area of development for you and you want somebody who's honest to watch this and give you feedback but but how far does this fit into your students needs does this speak to your students' needs? Does this help your students anyhow? Now, what happens during the observation? And we'll focus here about the observer. Because what happens during the observation for the teacher, the teacher teaches normally, right? It's, it's really important for the observer to think carefully beforehand about how to record the lesson, how to record what's happening in the lesson, how to, how to take notes. And there are several ways to do this. First, a written analysis, so you can go to the lesson with a notebook and you take notes on the techniques used by the teacher, how the students interact with each other and evidence, evidence, evidence. So this task was boring because it took too long time, more than planned. What's your evidence? Students didn't seem to be responsive. They remained silent, they weren't talking. And although the teacher planned this task for uh, like gave 10 minutes for this task, the teacher took more than 25 minutes in this task. So it's like it's it's like it's it ran over the time planned really. Or apart from the written analysis, you can step in, go to the observation with a checklist and the checklist is a very useful quick method of taking notes because you have pre identified predetermined items in the checklist on teaching and learning techniques. All right, so time management, giving clear instructions, monitoring effectively, setting up activities, uh, establishing rapport with the students. So you've got the list of pre identifying uh, identified teaching techniques and teaching skills. And you take the checklist, you go to the, the lesson and you tick, tick or cross, cross the items. It's useful quick, but it can be limited 
in the feedback because it's 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 a mechanical a little bit. So it's it could be useful to back the checklist up with more detail where necessary 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 to illustrate your points. One more method of recording the incidents and the events of the observation is video recordings. Sometimes teachers video record themselves. Sometimes they they ask somebody to come in and video record them. In any event, the recording will be the basis of a very useful, powerful learning discussion. So you together sit down, watch the recording together and start analyzing your teaching skills and making sure by watching together the video, you make sure that your discussion is neutral. That's why we think that video recording method is an objective method. So this is this what happens during the observation. And remember that in the three methods, whether the written analysis, the checklist, the video recording, what you record, what you take note of should be relevant to the agreed focus in the pre-observation, right? We, we focus on giving it clear instructions, so we take notes and we collect information on giving clear instructions and nothing else. So what happens after the observation? The observer and the teacher meet and they discuss and reflect on the information collected during the, the observation. And this, this discussion needs to be constructive and based on mutual respect and the trust. Now I'd like to share with you, I'd like to share with you some examples of reflective questions that you both can can use in the after observation uh, stage. And this is based on learning by doing by Graham Gibson 1988. So have a look, have a look at the table, take a minute or two to have a look at the table and I'll have uh, some questions for you. Um, while while um, people are, are thinking a little bit about that as we approach the, um, the, the, the final parts of this webinar, a couple of people have mentioned students in, in, in this and that um, students don't like being observed um, and that if as a teacher you're being observed, maybe the students will come to the conclusion that um, there's a problem. That's why there's some stranger in their classroom. That's a, the two quite interesting points there that probably we'll be able to, to return to at a, at a later date. And I think because there is such a lot in the, uh, the, 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 the subject of observation. Yeah, exactly. So, um... Yeah, I'll, I'll leave these examples uh, of reflective questions for you guys as a teacher and as the observer. To, I hope you can you can take a screenshot of this or something and we're, sh we're sharing the PowerPoint presentation anyways. So these are some questions for the observer and the teacher just to organize their thinking after the observation and to help them analyze the lesson. Um, very quickly, we're, we're going to look at some advice and some tips on uh, for giving feedback. And we've touched upon many of them anyway. So don't don't feel you're the expert. Your colleagues, it's called the peer observation. And uh, perhaps a good tip is to let your colleague comment on the lesson first. Don't start. Let the, the, your colleague start first. Ask your colleague about their objectives so that you understand what they were trying to achieve. Give honest feedback supported by evidence. Make sure your, your comments are not judgmental. Use reflective questions. We call them probing questions, something like, uh, what were you hoping to achieve when? So it's, it, it, it helps them think 
rather than asking them, why didn't you do this? Observe the action. Observe the students rather than the teacher. Discuss solutions and don't dwell too much on the problem. And when you discuss the solutions, let your colleague take the lead. Let them suggest the solution. Don't just tell them what you would do if, they, if you were in their place. When you agree on, when you discuss about, uh, when you discuss the next steps, make sure that your action plan or your suggested, your, your suggested uh, points is manageable and your action plan is manageable and aim to change one thing at a time, not everything uh, at once. How about if you're receiving feedback, if you're the teacher, again, be open, think before you respond and, and think, to un think to understand, not to reply quickly to, to your observer's comment. Feel free to explain from your point of view, but without defending what you did, just explain what, what you did and how you did it this way. And make notes. Notes will help you analyze your lesson and engage in useful discussions. And also, don't forget to ask your observer about what they have learned because it's a mutual, it's a mutual benefit process. And again, it's the same point. The action plan is manageable, but also agreed because it's you who's going to implement the action plan. So it's you own it. So you have to agree on it. Um, I think we can skip this part, John, about alternative models of peer observation. It doesn't have to be peer observation all the time. There is another example like lesson study where, where a group of colleagues plan the lesson together rather than observing each other. So they collaborate while planning the lesson and they collaborate again to reflect on the lesson after it happens. There is also the unseen observation where the two colleagues meet before and after, but, but the, the lesson itself isn't observed, but talked about afterwards. It's called the unobserved observation or un the unseen observation. Team teaching or co-teaching when the two colleagues teach together with the aim of watching each other in action and giving feedback to each other. And that's the end of our webinar. <laughs> OK, um, thank you so much indeed, Hala. I mean, like with everything that, that um, you, you talk about, there is just so much in there. And um, we, we never really seem to have um, enough time to, to look at um, everything that you've got to share with us in the kind of detail that it, it, it really merits. Um, but there's some really important points there for reflection that I think have, have come from yourself and, and also from the questions that we've had in, in the chat box. And I think, um, you know, one, one thing in particular, a word that, that you used, which I think resonated with many of the people here today is about double seeing and I think um, that's such an important concept isn't it because it's a, it's an opportunity to see others but it's also an opportunity to see yourself in others as well and I think that that along with the idea that uh, about openness and openness in in in, in terms of giving feedback um, in terms of the institutional attitude towards it but openness just generally just generally um, and this matches i think with what you were saying about um you know there's no need to be defensive it's about demonstrating what you did rather than defending it it's this opportunity um especially for younger teachers for less experienced teachers teachers who maybe feel a little bit nervous about being observed and that's uh, comments that have come in and what do you do with, with if you're nervous it gives them the opportunity to stand back and in a sense disown what what is after all um, a public event lots of other things in there about 
relationship between um, observation and other forms of CPD. And in particular, one of the, the points you brought out right at the beginning, which is, I think, absolutely crucial, this idea that, that observation is that opportunity to see the application of, of, of other forms of, of CPD, application of your, your learning in practice, and all sorts of really other things about the ownership of ideas, about um, what, what, what's a mistake, what's not a mistake, all of those, um, all of those things. And um, above all, I think, and this is something that um, both you and Nancy said almost simultaneously about the power to change. And I think that that's one of the things that observation can lead to. Any final comments from yourself, Hala? Before. No, I, I just, I just leave. I just want to leave the our our teachers today with these three useful resources. The the great article from Cambridge uh, about peer observation, and another useful article from the Teaching English website. Just, I hope they can take a screenshot of of the useful resources slides so they can read more if if they if they if they have time. Thank you so much. Thank you also to colleagues um, who joined us today who made all of this possible. Um, Asil, uh, Amira and Nora. Um, a big final thank you as always to Hala. Um, I enjoyed that probably more, more than I can express really. I really, really did enjoy that. Um, our next webinar will be on the 25th of November, so don't forget it's the last Thursday of every month um, at 4 p.m. It's on the subject again, again, a key topic on the pathway on pathways and planning for professional development. One aspect of which, of course, is lesson observation, which we've been talking about today. Finally, of course, a big thank you to all of you <clears throat> who've attended today. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you so much for the time that you've invested um, with us this afternoon. And um, have a very, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting a little bit emotional. Have a very good evening and we will see you um, same time, same Thursday in a month's time. Thank you so much indeed. Yes. All the best. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Can't see me. Bye-bye.